holy smokes, I have been getting tons of messages and emails from my listeners and viewers and fans and all that asking for help with their dogs over the top excited barking that is just completely life disrupting. And you know, I hear you, it can be so difficult. I mean, it can be frustrating, annoying, and it certainly can be a serious challenge if our neighbors start complaining, etc. Let's dive into the partnership lifestyle perspective about unwanted barking. Hi, I'm Kathy Kowalik, and I believe that our dogs connect us to the heart and soul of what really matters in life. So hang out, and we'll take a deep dive into the human-dog connection and explore strategies that will inspire you to create legendary, enlightened partnership with your dog. This is the Enlightened by Dogs podcast. Well, hey, Kathy Kowalik here, your host of Enlightened by Dogs. And holy smokes, I have been getting tons of messages and emails from my listeners and viewers and fans and all that asking for help with their dogs over the top, excited barking that is just completely life disrupting. And you know, I hear you, it can be so difficult. I mean, it can be frustrating, annoying, and it certainly can be a serious challenge if our neighbors start complaining, etc. All right, so let's dive into the partnership lifestyle perspective about unwanted barking. And I I think I want to start with this first piece, which is you know, dogs bark, people talk, we get excited and we vocalize in various ways in various situations. And so do our dogs, right? So it's normal. It's natural. It's not something that is an issue ordinarily. And we, you know, if you're thinking that you don't want your dog to express their excitement or their frustration, or their opinion about things through their voice, well, I mean, I don't even know what to say to that, right? Because then why do you have a dog? Dogs bark. That's what we what they do, right? And we love that about them. I mean, this is just their way of expressing. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to love like crazy, over-the-top, over aroused and inappropriate barking, right? You know what I mean? And so that's, we're going to talk about that today. Um, But I just wanted to make that clear right from the beginning that dogs bark and that's okay. And there's going to be some, you know, some amount of living with barking. That's the very nature of having a dog in our life. And so uh, you know, uh, in in a lot of ways, it's a matter of shifting our perspective about about that. You know, and and know that dogs will be dogs, and just that reframe or that shift in perspective can actually take a lot of pressure off and ha- help us to see the like the like the seriously unwanted barking, even that in a better way, so that we can get a fresh start. Okay. And so, so anyway, I wanted to start with that. And so there's a couple of, I don't know, like, like sections that I think will be helpful to share with you today. And so I think the first part is understanding our dogs. And I'm going to talk more about that. I've given you just like a preview of that, but we're going to talk a little bit more about understanding why dogs bark and then what to do about unwanted barking. And so that'll go into two categories, which is preventing and rehabbing. All right. So that that's kind of the, the bigger picture of what we're going to talk about today. All right. So let's talk about 
like what makes dogs bark and expand our understanding about this challenge or this struggle with unwanted, over-the-top, excitable barking that, you know, makes us crazy. And so I think about it in categories. This is how my brain sorts this out. And my, you know, decades of experience of not only having my own dogs, but working with many, many, like, thousands of client and student dogs over the years and helping them with this very issue. Okay. So there's four categories that I put that put this unwanted over the top barking into. And the first category is what I think of as hypersensitivity. And so that's just a a dog that is not filtering. So they're kind of on hyper alert, maybe like they're kind of a nervous type of dog and their brain is not filtering out noises or different things in their life that a normally balanced dog without historical issues or established habits would just filter out. Okay. And so hypersensitivity to specific things, let's say sounds or moving objects, et cetera, things that make them want to bark. And then the second category would be what I would call like a, a prey drive type of on a root cause. And that's, you know, kind of a normal dog thing. I mean, all dogs have at least some level of prey drive. That's what makes them, you know, that's because they're dogs, right? That's what dogs do. And so those dogs that they're barking because of movement, you know, so they're more likely to be triggered by things that move and they, and then their prey drive kicks in. And so they want to control and catch almost like hunt. It's like a hunting type of prey drive, right? And so they want to control and catch and stop that particular thing. And then the third category, which is very similar, which is a herding drive. And and so of course, as if you have a herding dog, you're probably well aware that herding, the, the drive to herd or control animals is kind of a modified prey drive, right? It's been nurtured through generations of breeding to eliminate the catch and kill piece of the prey and has uh, it's been shaped through selective breeding so that herding dogs will mindfully work in partnership with their human to control the animals and bring them to us, you know, in a, in a sort of a general sense. And then the fourth category Oh, and of course the, the herding dogs, you know, again, they do have the prey drive is that's part of it, right? There's, well, they, it's a separate thing. They can still have prey drive and they're, they also have that modified prey drive, which is the herding drive. And that's also a need to control and herding dogs are generally also sensitive. And so it's very, very common to have a herding dog that is that is hypersensitive and also has a strong a herding drive with meaning a need to control things okay so that combination is very very common and then the fourth thing is what i'm just going to call a, a self-employed sentinel and so that's a dog that has uh, assumed the position as protector of the realm and they are they're seeing things, animals and people and bikes and objects and whatever that in their mind appear to be invaders, they see them as needing to be told off, stop or back off or get away. You know what I mean? And so that sentinel or protector of the realm, and I call that self-employed because in most cases, it's not wanted, it's not valuable. That's different than an ordinary central type of role where our dogs do, you know, alert us to something that is genuinely amiss. And we want that. I mean, that's also one of the, you know, values of having a dog is that they let us know those things. But I'm talking, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in like an imbalanced or an inappropriate 
sentinel where they're just crying woof at everything, right? A sentinel or a protector is not helpful when everything is dangerous to them, right? They're just, you know, it, it's not helpful at all. And, and yeah, so we don't want that, right? That's not what we want. And we want to figure out how to help all four of these dogs be more balanced and to not need, not feel a need to vocalize in that way so often, if you know what I'm saying. All right. So what, do, what can we do? Let's talk about some ideas. Let me give you some tips of what we can do. All right. The very first and the most important by far thing that we can do is to prevent it from starting in the first place. Yes, you can. This is vital and it habits, especially unwanted or what we would call like quote unquote bad habits happen so fast. I mean, one, you know, I like to say that in one to three times of doing something, that's a, we already have the start of a new habit forming. And, you know, what's cute at three or four months old is really annoying at four years old, et cetera. You know what I mean? And so we really want to put the vast majority of our focus on prevention. And I'm going to give you a few tips. Now, these tips are going to apply to you, even if your dog already has an established habit of barking inappropriately. So listen up either way. It's just really important. It applies to everyone. Okay. You have a huge influence on your dog. And one of the things that we want to do is tap into and consciously use that influence. And I sort of speak about this in terms of being a role model, right? And so you want to be a positive role model that communicates to your dog how we would want to behave in any given situation, right? And as we start to build a stronger partnership lifestyle foundation, our dogs start looking to us more and more for that information. Like how do we, you know, how do we behave here? What are we supposed to do about this? What's, what's, what's the thing that we as a family do about this? And that's the beauty of a partnership lifestyle is that we have that very clear influence on our dogs in such a simple and profound way. And it, it doesn't require any training, right? It's really, really simple and natural for us to do and natural for our dogs to follow as well. Okay. And so here's a couple of the main ways that we can influence our dog through role modeling. And so one is just simply the mirror effect. And so we all social animals have mirror ne neurons. We, you know, we're, we are literally designed to mirror one another. I mean, this is what social is be one of the things, uh, one of the benefits or downfalls, if you will, of being, <laughs> Um, socially intelligent is that we are we are easily influenced by others in our family group, right? And so we want to use that in a mindful way to our advantage. And and so to role model things like you know I'm okay, you're okay. That's not a concern of ours. Let's not put any attention onto that. We just don't need to concern ourselves with that thing. You know what I mean? And so we have that, that sort of an attitude. And when we can congruently communicate that to our dogs, they get it. They just absolutely flat out get it. Now, another thing that we can do to influence our dog's choices is to pay attention to what we're doing with our own voice. And so in a nutshell, that means no yelling because from our dog's perspective, that is barking. And so if we yell at them because they're barking and, you know, we're trying to get them to shush up, 
it could very well be interpreted as, oh, great, you know, um, uh, my mom's joining in and she thinks it's exciting too, or she thinks that we should bark, chase that intruder away too, or she's worried about that sound too. You know what I mean? And, and so we just wanted to be really mindful about how we're using our own voice, knowing that it is a strong influence on our dog. Okay, so no yelling, that equals barking. Now, there are a lot of other ways that we can influence our dog with the unwanted barking, but that is really beyond the scope of this podcast. So, and of course, if you are already a uh, Brilliant Partners Academy member, you have access to this information. Now, what do we do if your dog already has a habit of barking in specific circumstances? So there's already a habit in place. Well, that's what we're going to talk about next. And so I'm going to give you two pieces. One is the four-step bark busting process. And then the second piece is we, we actually going to chunk it down. And I'm going to give you the eight-step protocol for influencing your dog's choice. So the four-step process and the eight-step bark busting protocol. All right. So let's start with the four-step bark busting process. Step number one is prevention is first. Don't let it get started in the first place. Step two in the process is you can use a management to help prevent and to help you get through the rehab process. The fourth step in the process, this is kind of like the, the process is our overview. The third step in the process is to use your influencers, such as role modeling, the mirror effect, and other ways that you have of influencing your dog's choices. And then step four in the bark busting process is the actual rehab protocol. Okay, so I'm going to then, now we're going to take number four, which is the rehab protocol, and I'm going to break that down for you. All right, so here we go. The eight-step bark busting protocol, the Bring and Partners way. All right, step one in the protocol is to prevent unwanted barking through management. And so that may mean that you need to, you know, keep your dog away from things that are triggering the barking. Maybe that's, you know, put your dog inside, put your dog outside, use the baby gate, et cetera, right? And so you want to think about what type of management that you can use to actually prevent the barking from getting started in the first place. And then step number two in the protocol is to be present and be prepared. Like 100% of the time, whenever you and your dog are in a circumstance that is likely to trigger the unwanted barking, right? Um, step, and I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to take you through this process with a real life example or two, okay? So uh, hang on. All right. And then step three in the protocol is to interrupt your dog's thought about barking or about the trigger and influence your dog's choice not to bark before the barking starts. That's really important. All right. Step four in the protocol is to capture one quiet moment at a time. Step five in the protocol is to reinforce the quiet moment from the very beginning before the trigger fires. Step six is to repeat your one moment at a time reinforcement until the trigger event is over. Step seven is to celebrate. Yay, you did it. There's no barking. And then step eight is to rinse and repeat until a new habit is formed that replaces the old barking habit. And let me tell you, that goes way faster than you might think, right? It, this is actually a very, very quick 
process. It takes a lot longer to explain it to you than it takes to do it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to share two prevention examples that are like current events that just happened within the last couple of weeks in my own life with my dogs. Okay. So I'm going to show you how I prevented what could have been new habits from forming before they started using the protocol. Okay. All right. So the first example is with my puppy, Harry, um, about 14 weeks old, and he, he's a border collie and he's very clever and he's very alert. And, you know, hey, he comes from a long line of uh, working uh, dogs that are attentive and responsive and also excitable. Okay, so here's one of the things that I saw develop really. It was like it's like like there was no response from him in his weeks of young life. And then all of a sudden one day, boom, there it was. and. I needed to nip it in the bud right away. Okay, so here's the, let me give you the uh, the scenario. I'll paint the scenario for you. All right, so Joe comes in the house, like he's, you know, out working outside or he's out doing errands. This would happen when he would come home from work. So Raven just absolutely adores Joe. She, you know, she like, she just loves him. He, whatever. I mean, she loves me too, but she doesn't do this with me he comes home and she gets like, I don't know, almost hysterically joyful. So she's squealing and she, she whines and she wiggles and she just, she makes a big fuss over his entrance. Okay. And you, whatever, you know, I, I just basically don't do anything about it. It's what, like, you know what I mean? I, whatever. Like, it's just one of those, like, yeah, whatever things. However, <laughs> What started to happen, all of a sudden, one day, Joe came in the house and Raven was doing her thing and Harry alert, like he just like locked onto it and he decided to be the fun police and I mean, he was like 12 weeks old, right? And I saw him like look at her and like puff himself up and like his little cute, just adorable. Oh my God. So cute. Puppy, little puppy bark. He went Roof! like, Roof! like to bark at her, like telling her to stop that, like knock it off. Like, you know, he was telling, he, he was definitely telling her like, that is just not appropriate. And of course, she's just ignoring him, whatever, you know what I mean? And at first, that first response on my part was like, oh, isn't that cute? He's, and then of course, the next thought is, uh oh, <laughs> like, uh oh, like Raven does this all the time. And if he's going to start telling her off, Houston, we could have a problem, right? And so the next, so now I went into my, uh, number step number two in the protocol, which is to be present and to be prepared. Okay. And so the next time that Joe was coming in the house and I anticipated that Raven would be doing her like, oh my God, you've been gone forever. And I love you so much routine, very vocal. I decided the way there's, there's certainly several different ways I could have approached this, but I decided to go for the very root cause. And I decided to put my focus on Raven instead of Harry. Okay. So I it could have went the other way and either one would have likely have been effective, but I decided like, Hey, let, let's, maybe we could actually do something about all this noise with Raven in the first place. Like I should have thought of, about this a long time ago. So what I did was I stepped in. So like I'd say I was sitting at my desk, Joe came in the kitchen through the kitchen door and Raven ran in there, you know, and got all excited. And I saw, I heard Harry like doo -doo 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 -doo, his little puppy, his little puppy uh, steps running in there too. And so I got up and I went and I intercepted Raven and I, and I just, you know, was close. And I said, Raven, you know, come on, that's enough. 
come on this way. And so I just called her off with me and, you know, and then, you know, good girl, you know, thank you so much. You know, so I, you know, loved, loved her for coming off with me. And I was basically my idea. My intention was to role model Jill coming home. Isn't that big of a deal. And, you know, we don't need to make that big of a fuss. And so that's what I was trying to role model for her. And I did it in just in a very matter of fact, neutral way. And um, Harry immediately, of course, responded to that. And he didn't bark or he maybe he did once, you know, he barked maybe once first, you know. Um, And then he just came off with me and Raven and, and everything was fine. Right. And so then I did that again, you know, later that day or the next day, whatever. So I did that about two or three times in a row where I my my focus was on circumventing Raven to get her to calm and greet Joe in a calmer way without all that all the noise you know what I mean so far so good right so Raven's actually much more settled with Joe coming in so she's been doing this for a a long number of years right and so I do not mean to suggest that she has a new habit yet for sure she does not. However, there, you know, it was easy enough to um, interrupt that old habit by just being present and having a clear intention. And that automatically prevented Harry from developing his own habit. You see, you see what I'm saying? Okay. So that's one example of, of how I use prevent that protocol in as prevention. Um, so I, I went through basically all the quick steps in the protocol, but very, very quickly and easily. You could see how natural it is. Like it, it's, it, it's a very simple thing. Okay. This, the second example is I got a, a new coffee grinder and I, I, I was ordering my coffee ground already pre-ground and I decided to get it in whole bean form and grind it. And I was concerned that the, the sound of the grind, cause the grinder makes that really high pitch noisy thing, you know, that can really be triggering to dogs. And so I was concerned that it would potentially trigger one or more of the dogs to start barking at it. And I was hesitant to get it, but I decided, oh, I really want, I, you know, I really want to fresh grind my coffee beans. So I went ahead and ordered it and it came and I thought, okay, I need to be present and be prepared. Right. And so What I did was the first day that I went to use it, I was just really present and I wanted to notice, did anything, did any of the dogs get agitated about the sound of the grinder or whatever? And so I was proactively role modeling how I wanted them to respond to the grinder, which was by doing nothing. Okay. And so I was just breathing and I, I hit the button on the grinder and then I just walked away from it. You know, it was on the kitchen counter and I just kind of walked away and went and got a cup of water. I mean, you know, like, w- whatever, it only takes like 10 or 20 seconds to grind. It's a very short, brief, you know, period of time. And so I role modeled the grinder is no concern of ours by stepping away from it and just doing something else. And none of the dog, I saw a couple of the dogs like kind of alert, like, well, that's a different sound. But then they saw me, they saw what I was doing, which was role modeling that noise, that new thing is no concern of mine. And then I saw that I saw like heads lift up or, you know, someone walked in and looked and then they saw me and then everyone just put their heads back down and went and walked away or laid back down or whatever. And so it was basically a non-event. And I repeated that for the next few days. What I repeated, which was, which was just step number two, which was be present, be prepared, and uh, influence through role modeling, right? So it was very, very simple. Uh, I didn't have to do any further action because none of the dogs, it never went beyond that, okay? So that's just a really, those are good examples of how, what to do when you don't have 
a habit in a place or you see the budding like with harry you see that like ooh. Oh, I, I, I need to make a plan. I need to be present and let me figure something out about this before it becomes a habit, right? Because remember, like three times, it's a habit, right? Okay. Now, the, the last little story I wanted to share with you is a, a rehab which, which process, which is very similar to this, right? And so I followed the protocol and this was years ago with the Vitamixer where I had a dog that was already had a habit of being triggered by my Vitamix and she was Phoenix and she was like, she would like go absolutely nutty about the sound of the Vitamix. And as soon as she heard the Vitamix, like as soon as I pulled it away from the, the back, um, you you know, like it's storage space and I pulled it out to, to use it on the counter. She just, that part, that sound in itself would already start to get her going. And of course, you know, all the little mini triggers, the little sub triggers, like the, the lid going on. It's you know, like, you know what I mean? All the things, right? So she would go nutty and bark and spin and jump and da da da. I mean, yes, it only lasts for like whatever, 30 seconds, but it feels like an eternity when your dog is getting nutty. You know what I mean? And so I really didn't, you know, I wanted to prevent her from doing that. You know, I wanted to stop that old habit. Um, mainly because I suppose if I had to be honest with myself, I did not want her to teach it to a puppy because I had a puppy, right? I, I just, so what I did was start, start the protocol before I started messing with the Vitamix, right? And so one of the things that we do, one of the ways we influence our dog as, uh, as brilliant partners is that we love our dog, love our dog and love our dog's good choices from our heart. Like this, we're talking about way beyond like click treat or, you know, uh, superficial praise. We're talking or transactional type of praise. We're talking about heart to heart connection. I love what you're doing here. You are amazing. So that's how, that's what I decided to do with her. And so I went into the kitchen. It's my morning routine, like morning smoothie, whatever. and you know, she's like, woohoo, okay, Vitamix, you know, you could already see her getting aroused, you know, and I, instead of starting with my routine, I connected with her and I made a heart to heart connection and I told her how much I loved her. So it sounded like this. Oh, you're such a good girl. You're amazing. I love when you hang out in the kitchen with me while I'm making my smoothie, you are amazing and brilliant. And I love sharing this routine with you. And I love that you get to share a little bit of my smoothie. And so I'm talking to her like that and, 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 you know, and loving on her. And I was like, would you like to have a cookie? And like, I'm going to back it up with a cookie too. Right. So I'm going to like pull out all the big guns, right? The biggest big gun, the cannon, if you will, maybe it's the atomic bomb. I don't know, is the love, the heart connection and the loving her choice. And then the backup you know, the little backup ammunition is the cookie, the treat. And so, oh, would you like a cookie? I so give her a little treat. Great. You know, I'm going to make my smoothie and I'm, ta- I'm ta- telling her what I'm doing before I do it. Yeah. All right, I'm going to pull it out. Right. Oh, you're such a good girl. You're amazing. And she's like, whoa, what is this new thing we're doing here? Right. Yeah. I'm going to go get my stuff out of the fridge and da da da. I'm going to put it in, you know, and I'm talking to her the whole time. And occasionally giving her a treat, but loving, engaging with her and being fully present and loving on her the whole time. And so the whole thing, you know, Vitamix went on, da, da, da. And then I, of course, have to clean it. And so then it's put the water in and then turn it back on to, to rinse it out, right? So the whole thing is happening. I'm talking to her. I'm fully present. I'm congruent and I'm role modeling that the Vitamix is no concern of ours. And so I'm putting like 90% of my focus and attention onto my dog, maybe 10% on the Vitamix and what I'm doing. Does that make sense? And no barking. Talking about she had been barking for years, right? I mean, this is like a very embedded habit. No barking. I'm like, woohoo, that was a success, right? I repeated it the second day. And the second day, I didn't have to work anywhere near as hard. She was already anticipating 
this new thing that we're doing, right? I started, I was present. I started right before I did started the Vitamix thing and it was much easier. She was already on board with it. Like, because engaging with mom and, and having this heart connection was much more enjoyable and reinforcing to her than either, you know, barking at the Vitamix or certainly more reinforcing than the treat, right? And by the third day, it was, she was it. It was done. We never had to do it. And so I always, for some time in the future, was present with her. And I wanted to make sure that that new habit what became embedded. And so I was present and attentive and, and et cetera. But it was, it, it really, it became, by the third day, it became a non-event and she didn't even, wasn't even thinking about barking. She really wasn't triggered by the Vitamix anymore. So that's how fast things can go when we do it right. Okay. And, um, uh, here's a tip for you. Here's a, a ninja pro tip. That is one of the biggest mistakes that we make in something like this, when we want, we want to capture that moment where everything is perfect and we love how things are going. And that is that we wait too long, right? And so we wait, we don't intend to wait, but we wait so long that the, the trigger is triggered and our dog is, it starts doing the thing, right? But yeah, you know, so we only have a, it's like a millisecond. We have to be really present in order to make this happen. Okay. So that's, that's your, uh, your ninja, ninja tip. All right. So let me just quickly review, um, the process. Num step number one, prevention is the most important thing. Don't let it get started. Step two in the process is manage, manage to help prevent the, uh, the habit from forming and to help you get through the rehab process. So sometimes we have to do more, um, more management depending on what the trigger is. We want to use our influencers, notably our role modeling and our mirror effect. And step four in the process is to follow the rehab process protocol. And the, the, the rehab, the barking, the bark busting, uh, protocol Steps are one, to prevent through management. Number two, be present and prepared 100% of the time. Number three, interrupt your dog's thought and influence your dog's choice not to bark before it starts. Number four, capture one quiet moment at a time. Number five, reinforce the quiet moment in the very beginning before the trigger actually fires. Number six, repeat your one moment at a time until the trigger event is over. Uh, number seven, yay, celebrate, you did it. Number eight, rinse and repeat until a new habit is, is formed. Now, there are more pieces, right? There are you know, different trigger categories, noisy things, moving things, noisy moving creatures, things that you need help with. And so there are categories of barking triggers that are beyond the scope of what we can talk today, but they are well covered. And, and I deeply explain what to do with each of these things, what to do when your dog is barking at kids and cats and dogs and wildlife and bikes and cars and the vacuum cleaner and the lawnmower, the sprinkler, you know, monkey shines, you know, um, thing like in the car, do ringing doorbell, knocking, you know, you know what I mean? There's, there's a lot of things that are, that fall into the more difficult categories of rehabbing, you know, when you have old habits and for those things, I need you to do the workshop, the bark busting masterclass workshop that that's, that's what you need, right? In, and in addition to that, what you need is the whole protocol for safe, calm and happy. And here's a great example from someone that has gone through all of the steps, all the things that I share with you, you know, that, that found those foundation pieces, the beginning pieces. And this is from Bettina. I just wanted to read what she wrote. Her husband, Rob, she says, Rob is getting his windshield replaced and both Mary and Bear are in the room. No barking. 
before joining BPA and living the partnership lifestyle, our dogs would have been barking at anyone coming close to our yard. This morning, I did a heart connection with all three dogs, told them the guy was coming after lunch and fixing Rob's window, that he has permission to do it. When he arrived, I reminded them, I role modeled, and they were quiet the whole time. Partnership lifestyle rocks. So that's what you can have too. Now, you're going to want to join the Brilliant Partners Academy because there's so much more so that you and your dog can get started with a a life that is full filled with joy and delight and safe, calm and happy. All right. So that's what I have for you today, my friends. I hope this was helpful and uh, you'll be amazed at what it'll be like when you and your dog can finally understand one another. All right, so go off, be brilliant, and I will talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening. And hey, if you would like to work with me so that I can help you discover the missing pieces you need so that you and your dog can finally be happy and enjoy life together, then head on over to DancingHeartsDogAcademy.com and request your invitation to join us in the Brilliant Partners Academy when the doors open for the next enrollment. See you next time. And remember, a brilliant partnership with your dog makes your whole life brilliant.